December 7th, 1941. In the early morning hours, Japan launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The results were devastating. With one stunning blow, Japan brought an outraged America into the war. Across the country, U.S. war production immediately shifted into high gear. At the Newport News shipyard in Virginia, construction continued around the clock. Ships like the USS Intrepid, a new 27,000-ton aircraft carrier, were a top priority. Normally, a ship of this size would take at least three years to build, but with the war underway, Intrepid was ready to launch in less than a year and a half. Seventeen stories high and three football fields long, Intrepid was one of the new Essex-class carriers. Bigger, faster, and more powerful than the Navy's earlier flat tops, these great floating airfields could carry up to 100 planes at a time and travel at speeds of 33 knots, or roughly 37 miles an hour. They would soon replace the battleship as the U.S. Navy's capital ships. In August 1943, the USS Intrepid prepared to join the fighting in the Pacific after welcoming aboard her first crew of 3,500 men. Men like Hector Gianasca, a 17-year-old from Queens, New York, who had never seen an aircraft carrier until he stepped off the bus from boot camp. They stopped the bus, and one of the chiefs on the bus said, Gentlemen, there's your new home. And we looked down, and there was the USS Intrepid. While looking at the size of that ship, we thought we were chosen sailors to be put on this big, tremendous ship. But as these new recruits soon learned, serving on a carrier was a dangerous job, particularly for the naval aviators, who had to take off and land on a moving runway. Gianasca would become a member of an Airedale crew. His job involved taking care of the planes and strapping in pilots before takeoff. Those were brave men, those pilots that took off the ship. In fact, I remember one fellow that got in and he took his shoes off. So I said, sir, what are you doing? He said, I always take my shoes off, it's good luck. <laughs> Fine, they all had their own personal things that they did when they took off the ship. Richard Duckett was one of those brave naval aviators who flew dozens of combat missions off the USS Intrepid. He says it's the landing that really tests a pilot's skill. Takeoff is by no means an exciting event vis-a-vis -vis the landing. The landing is where it really, <laughs> the men from the boys. When you make your final turn to come up to the rear of the carrier, that's the time when the landing signal officer takes you in his care. And he is a man with supreme authority. He commands the ship at that point. He's commanding you. And as you approach the ship, your eyes are glued on him. And until he raises one paddle and slices across his neck, then you chop your throttle, then you pay attention to the landing. There were 16 wires strung across the flight deck, and the plane's hook had to snag one of them immediate emotion when you feel that hook is thank God. Every time it's thank God. The mission is over. You've landed safely back aboard again and the skipper isn't going to chew you out for doing something wrong. You've done it right. However, not everyone made it safely back aboard the ship. Many planes damaged during combat would crash on landing. Flight deck crews did everything they could to get the men out alive. But sometimes, all they could do was get out of the way. 
Joe Liotta had first-hand experience with the dangers of landing on a carrier. He was a radar operator on a combat mission when the plane was hit by enemy fire. He recalls how the pilot tried to reassure the crew. He says, don't worry, I shut off the gas tank, everything looks all right. Just let me know when we get back to the ship if the wheels come down. If we got back aboard the carrier, I took off my seatbelt like I normally do, and all of a sudden, we went up so fast, I think the throttle must have been jammed because he couldn't stop the plane. I thought we were going to hit a barrier, but what we did is we spun around on the left wheel because the hydraulic was shot out of the right wheel. A Navy photographer aboard Intrepid took these dramatic photos of Liotta's plane as it somersaulted off the flight deck. When I saw we were going over the side, I stood up and braced myself right over the side, 90 feet into the water, upside down. I didn't even get a scratch. Liotta and two of his fellow crewmen managed to get out of the plane and swim to the surface. But we never saw the pilot. And since we had our life jackets open, we were floating in the water. We couldn't go down, you know what I mean? He went down with the plane, Tim Vaughan. He was only 22 years old. Just two months after joining the U.S. fleet in the Pacific, Intrepid would face the first of many trials that earned the ship her nickname, the Fighting Eye. During February 1944, Intrepid's fast carrier task force attacked Truck Island, Japan's main base in the Pacific. For two days, her planes roared over the target zone, bombing enemy anchorages and airfields. But on the night of February 16th, just before midnight, Intrepid was on station with the rest of the fleet when a lone Japanese torpedo plane wormed its way through the screen of destroyers. We knew we had a Japanese plane on radar. We were following him for 20 minutes. He was cycling the fleet, cycling the fleet, cycling. And we didn't want to open up fire, because if we did, then we'd give away the carrier, the task force. I was on the flight deck. We looked up and we saw three Japs in a torpedo plane. That plane saw the wake of the Intrepid, came over the flight deck, went way back aft, and dropped the torpedo. The torpedo ripped through the ship's starboard side, killing 11 men and wounding 17. These photos, taken by an intrepid crewman shortly afterward, show the strength of the blast. The torpedo tore a huge gash in the ship's hull and mangled the rudder, making it impossible to steer the carrier. Hours passed as Intrepid floundered, and her men prayed that more enemy planes would not find the damaged carrier. We were going around in a circle. So they, this one chief got a brilliant idea. They had a lot of sail on board. So they rigged up a 40-foot square canvas sail, and they put it up forward on a port side of the bow. And that compensated with the engines on the other side. We were able to straighten out. We didn't know what was going to happen until the situation came up with the sail. And I tell you, uh, that, that saved our lives, really. Got us back to Pearl Harbor. Intrepid had lived up to her name. And after she was repaired and refitted, she rejoined the U.S. fleet in the Pacific. Colonel Lowell Kagi headed a Marine detachment stationed aboard Intrepid. He recalls what it was like serving on a carrier during wartime. There's people that stayed on their battle stations almost all the time at sea if we were in a combat area. Because when they sound that general quarters, that bugle goes, you don't waste any time or you'll, they'll secure the doors down below or, or the hatches. And you could be locked down below and not get to your battle station. 
Okay, it got pretty hectic down here with all these crew members going to their general water station. In fact, that hatch door had to be closed if we got too much water coming through so we wouldn't flood the other compartment. I had to get to the flight deck, so I'm quite away from it now. But I had to jump up this ladder right here, get to my general quarter stations, and hope for the next guy to come through. October 17, 1944. With its battle-tested crew on alert, Intrepid's task force steamed towards the Philippines. The fighting eye was about to play a key role in the greatest naval battle in history, the Battle for Leyte Gulf. U.S. commanders chose Leyte Gulf as the landing site for their troops, who were preparing to storm the beaches and reclaim the Philippines from the Japanese. The USS Intrepid was with the 3rd Fleet under the command of Admiral Bull Halsey. Halsey's job was to provide air support to protect the U.S. invasion forces. Japan knew an invasion was coming and was determined to stop it at all costs. The Japanese commanders devised a plan to lure the 3rd Fleet away from Leyte Gulf. They positioned their aircraft carriers to the north as a decoy, hoping Halsey would go after them. Then their battleship task forces would attack the U.S. invasion fleet in Leyte Gulf. But on October 24th, that plan was foiled by intrepid scout planes, which spotted the main Japanese battleship force as it tried to slip into Leyte Gulf. Richard Duckett was in the first squadron of intrepid planes sent on the attack. He looked down from his Helldiver bomber to see this great fleet of Japanese warships spread out below. We knew that this group was ringed with destroyers and cruisers, just absolutely loaded with many aircraft guns, so it was going to be no picnic. I mean, the, the, the juices were running heavier than you can imagine. Among that huge group of Japanese warships was the super battleship Musashi, the largest ever built. And as luck would have it, this was the ship Ducket Squadron chose to dive bomb. With, you know, 1900 horsepower engine roaring in the ears, there weren't any sounds. You literally couldn't hear a thing. If you heard anything, it was the pounding of the blood in your ears. Your only primary thought is you're going to hit that battleship because if you hit that battleship, maybe you'll shake them up enough so that they can't shoot straight. Your next thought is going to be how to get away out of that great ring of ships without being killed. Duckett dropped his bombs and made it safely back aboard Intrepid. Planes from other U.S. carriers soon joined the attack, pounding Musashi with 36 bomb and torpedo hits. Finally, towards evening, the great ship keeled over and sank with all 2,200 crew members aboard. In continuous fighting over four days, Japan suffered tremendous losses. By the end, its navy, once the third most powerful in the world, was no longer an effective fighting force. The United States had won a tremendous victory, but Japan still had one last weapon it would unleash against Intrepid and the rest of the U.S. fleet in the coming months. A terrifying weapon born of sheer desperation, the kamikaze. was a sight intrepid crewmen would come to dread. Swarms of Japanese planes screeching through the sky, determined to plunge into the deck of an American ship. They were called kamikazes, Japan's version of a human guided missile. 
when a young Japanese pilot volunteered to join the Kamikaze Corps. He did it in the belief that he was going to die for his country, for his emperor, and that his death would allow his country to be saved. So he went with absolute total determination to go ahead and die. October 29, 1944. USS Intrepid was flying airstrikes against Japanese bases in the Philippines when the ship became the target of one of the first kamikaze attacks of the war. As enemy planes bore down on Intrepid, Alonzo Swan was at his post, manning a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. A member of one of the few all-black gun crews in the US fleet, Swan looked up to see a plane coming right at him. It was so fast that it happened, but in my mind it was slow motion. And the plane sort of drifted. Uh, we knocked one wing off, and we were trying to shoot the other wing off. When it came down, it missed the flight deck, and at the last instant, the wing swung, and when it did, it hit right into the gun tub. When the explosion came, it just blew me out. Boom, I hit the deck. As soon as I hit the deck, I bounced right back up. Though severely burned, Swan ran back into the fire to help a buddy, still strapped to his gun. My friend was burning to death, and I leaned over him. I tried to get up underneath to cut the strap first, and it was so hot up under there, I couldn't get the strap cut. So I reached around my knife to go around his back, and that's when another explosion happened, and that killed him. Fire crews rushed to the rescue, but it was too late. Ten members of the gun tub were dead. When they picked up these bodies, they put them on stretches. They were bringing them towards the island. And that's the first time, really, that I saw a dead person. I just, to this day, will never forget that sight. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable, really. The ship's captain recommended the survivors for the Navy Cross, its highest combat award. But back in 1944, few black sailors received the Navy Cross for their heroism. Not until many years later did Swan finally get the recognition he deserved. Nearly half a century after his heroic actions, Alonzo Swan will be receiving the Navy's highest award, the Navy Cross. He's with us tonight and I have had the honor of dining with him this evening. Alonzo, will you please stand and receive 50 years of admiration? <laughs> President Reagan inviting me to come up to my ship to have a dinner and recognize me. That is the greatest day of my life. When intrepid crewmen were not dodging kamikazes and torpedoes, they took time out to kick back and relax. The ship was a floating city, where a sailor could get anything from a haircut to an ice cream sundae. While you're under attack or something, things are, are, are rough and they can be rough. But there's many good times on there. We used to bring down the forward elevator and we had baskets rigged up on the sides and we played uh, what we call jungle basketball. And that means anything goes, you know, there's no such thing as a foul. Mail call was another important morale booster. Kagi was a member of the censor board that reviewed each letter for classified information. It really got interesting reading some of these letters. Uh, you'd read from some sailor or a marine who's uh, writing a young lady and then you'll see five letters to five different girls all with the same message in it you know I miss you I can't get along without you uh, so you take your scissors and you cut most of that stuff out well I had a girl back home in New York uh, in fact uh, we used to write to each other quite often but whenever she got mail from me there were pieces cut out and when I met her on the leave, she says, what were you ever writing about? I never got a letter that I could really understand from you. General quarters, general quarters, all hands, man your battle station. November 25th, 1944. 
It was just past noon when general quarters sounded. 25 kamikazes were approaching from the south. Intrepid's planes took off to meet the attack. After a fierce air battle, the ship's pilots downed several kamikazes. Intrepid's gunners were knocking down others when one somehow managed to slip through the ship's defenses. Crewmen watched in horror as this plane dove through a blizzard of flak and crashed headlong into the flight deck. Firefighters were battling the blaze when yet another kamikaze rocketed through Intrepid's flight deck into the hangar below. The ship was covered in flames so intense that it looked like the crew might have to abandon ship. Hank Siraka was on the navigation bridge, overlooking all the damage. The captain turned around and he ordered the tune to be played, the bearer went over the mountain, which means abandoned ship. And he got on the speaker and he was telling the men that he wanted us to abandon ship. The men were going like this. He mistook that to mean that they didn't want to abandon ship. But what they were telling the captain is, we can't hear you. The PA system is out. But instead of abandoning ship, the men redoubled their efforts to save Intrepid. The battleship New Jersey came alongside to protect the defenseless carrier against more attacks. And after a three-hour struggle, the massive fires were finally extinguished. Once again, the Intrepid crew had hung in there and saved their ship. But as this footage shows, the carrier suffered tremendous damage. Intrepid crewmen tried valiantly to save as many of the wounded as possible. But altogether, 73 men were killed in that double kamikaze attack. In keeping with naval tradition, the men who died at sea were buried at sea. It's a very sad ceremony because, you know, you're burying your shipmates. People that uh, uh, you may have had breakfast with or stood a gun watch with. And, and they're gone just that quickly. Intrepid would have two more run-ins with kamikazes before the end of the war. In 1945, she was off the coast of Japan when a Japanese heavy bomber just missed the carrier, exploding alongside. The blast covered Intrepid with burning gas and debris. And a month later, at Okinawa, where the skies were thick with kamikazes, Five came roaring out of the clouds towards Intrepid. Anti-aircraft fire downed all but one that crashed into the ship. But Okinawa marked the end for Japan and its kamikaze attacks. On August 6, 1945, the United States brought the war to a close by dropping the atom bomb. Battle-scarred, but never beaten, Intrepid finished the war with an admirable record. Her air group sank 80 enemy ships, 
and her planes and guns destroyed more than 650 aircraft. This ship taught us don't give up because it never gave up itself. Of all the kamikazes, all the bombs that were hit, the fires and everything else, all we said, you're not going to get the best of me. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And it did come back. At the end of World War II, USS Intrepid was placed in reserve. But this tough old ship wouldn't stay mothballed for long. In the 1950s, she underwent a $40 million rebuild so she could accommodate modern fighters and bombers. Changes included powerful new steam catapults, which helped launch planes faster, and an angled deck, allowing planes to take off and land simultaneously. In the early 60s, NASA would choose this new and improved Intrepid as its prime recovery vessel for Mercury and Gemini astronauts. May 24, 1962. Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter, the second American to orbit the Earth, splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean. Cameras captured the action as he was hoisted aboard an Intrepid helicopter and shuttled safely back to Intrepid. This kind of picture-perfect helicopter recovery was repeated in March 1965 when Intrepid picked up Gemini astronauts Gus Grissom and John Young and their capsule, the unsinkable Molly Brown. The recovery team located the astronauts some 60 miles short of target. Commander Young recalls the long wait inside the capsule. We were in our pressure suits, so we were getting hotter and hotter. So we opened our visors and uh, took off our helmets. It's a great spaceship, but it wasn't much boat. It would, uh, it would wallow pretty badly in the water. Mainly we just sat there and waited for the recovery crew to put the uh, recovery parachutes around the vehicle, get it stabilized, and then we opened the hatch. We practiced that uh, helicopter recovery out in the Gulf where they uh, come over and, and drop the hook and you'd sit on that hook and they'd pull you right in the vehicle. <music> Gus and I got out of our suits and put on our bathrobes and we got a great ride with the Intrepid Recovery Crew back to the ship. You always shake hands with everybody that's uh, standing around and uh, that's normal and uh, say hello to them because they've done a great service for the country, I think, getting that vehicle back. When Intrepid wasn't recovering astronauts for NASA, she took part in fleet exercises in the Atlantic and Mediterranean. Senator John McCain was a naval bomber pilot aboard Intrepid during this period. I've made three Mediterranean cruises on the Intrepid, and of all the carriers that I've been on, I enjoyed the Intrepid the most. It was a small ship. We knew that we weren't as big a deal as the, as the big carrier, so we were always trying to outperform them in sorties flown and all that kind of stuff. Senator McCain recalls how in competition with new supercarriers, nearly twice her size, Intrepid still managed to hold her own. We would pull alongside a carrier like the Forrestal or the Saratoga. And while they were launching airplanes with four catapults, we would be launching with two, and we would get our planes launched before they would, which I'm sure used to drive the commanding officer of the larger carrier bananas. At a time when other ships were being retired, Intrepid remained on active duty, even as the country got caught up in the longest and most frustrating struggle in its history the Vietnam War. 
August 23, 1964. North Vietnamese patrol boats reportedly attacked two U.S. destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin. President Johnson ordered the first American combat troops into Vietnam. And as the war escalated, he also sent U.S. carriers, including Intrepid, to the South China Sea to carry out a bombing campaign against the North Vietnamese. Admiral Ed Martin, a naval bomber pilot aboard Intrepid, was flying a combat mission over North Vietnam in July 1967, when his A-4 Skyhawk came under fire from surface-to-air missiles. I personally had counted 13 missiles fired at me before uh, I zigged when I should have zagged and I, I rolled out from evading two and a third one detonated in front of me and I, I really ingested the shrapnel from this missile. The plane caught on fire and I lost all controls and had to eject. As I descended in the parachute, there were about a dozen Vietnamese, some of them just children with these AK-47s, and they were shooting at me uh, as I came down. And they, they literally caught me, and, and they beat me rather severely uh, when I got on the ground. Uh, not a very pleasant uh, situation. And then it only got worse from then. Martin was taken to the Hanoi Hilton, a Vietnamese prison camp, where he would spend six long years. During his time in prison, Martin met up with John McCain, also shot down on a combat mission. McCain, who was pulled from a lake with both his arms and one leg broken, spent five and a half years as a POW. I don't recommend the treatment, but I know that I'm a better person for having experienced it. And it has given me an intense appreciation for the wonders and beauties of this country and the freedoms that are associated with it. January 1973, at the Paris Peace Talks, the United States and North Vietnam signed an agreement, ending America's participation in the war. Within 60 days from this Saturday, all Americans held prisoners of war throughout Indochina will be released. Three months later, John McCain and Ed Martin were among nearly 500 American POWs who made it home. They were the lucky ones. More than 50,000 American men died in the Vietnam War. In a time of crisis, USS Intrepid had again served her country proudly. After completing three consecutive Vietnam combat tours, the Navy recognized the fighting eye as the most battle-ready ship in the fleet. Even though she was 25 years old at the time and she had half of the capability of the modern supercarriers, the spirit of her men, the devotion to duty, and their training enabled them to be awarded that very uh, prestigious title of best ship in the fleet. On that high note, Intrepid would retire after the Vietnam War. Today, her place is filled by supercarriers, which continue to provide the U.S. Navy with a flexible alternative in times of international conflict. All the way from World War II to today, there's a thread, and it is the ability to move air power at your discretion without any necessity for agreement from anyone else and get it right in the right place at exactly the right time to be decisive. If a potential enemy knows that there is this carrier either visible off the coast or just over the horizon out of view, but in a matter of minutes, the power aboard that carrier with its 5,000 sailors and its 100 or so airplanes uh, could be brought into an action, that certainly has a deterrent effect on any potential aggressor. And it also has a reassuring effect or friends who feel threatened to know that the power of the United States is just over the horizon. She had survived two wars and more than 30 years of active service. But in 1976, the USS Intrepid was headed for the scrap heap. 
A sad ending for this proud ship. She was well beyond her years, and she was destined to be scrapped. It was the Navy, however, that very wisely put her out and asked cities and states if there was any interest in trying to make her a museum or a monument. But it wasn't a city or a state that came to Intrepid's rescue. It was one man, a prominent New York City builder named Zachary Fisher. When Fisher heard Intrepid was to be scrapped, he felt something should be done to save this historic ship. If we lost a ship like this, the youngsters of this city or the country or the world would never know what it takes, the blood that it takes to the sacrifices, to win a war or to give them freedom. In 1977, Fisher and his wife Elizabeth decided to take on the tremendous job of turning a 33,000 ton aircraft carrier into a museum. A task made all the more difficult because the ship had been sitting in a dock, neglected, for eight years. You could not walk on this ship safely because the pigeons had taken over. It was just a mess. Now, the same thing with the pier, Pier 86, where the ship sits today. I walked down that pier with the Commissioner of Ports and Terminal. I could have fallen on the Hudson River a hundred places. So these are the kinds of things that you would look at and say, oh, I can't touch that. Not Fisher. Not Fisher. He'd look at it and say, well, we can fix that. We can do that. We can fix the pier. I know how to do that. We can fix the ship. I can find somebody that can do that. All of these projects required money, but Fisher did not hesitate. My recollection, and it's a long time ago now, is that uh, the city had to put in well over a million dollars uh, to uh, build uh, the uh, dock and do the things that uh, permit uh, this uh, fantastic uh, aircraft carrier to uh, be here. Uh, but what we spent uh, pales next to what Zach Fisher spent. He spent uh, in excess of $25 million when I was mayor. It took five years of hard work. But finally, on August 4th, 1982, the intrepid Sea Air Space Museum opened its doors to the public. The ship's sprawling hangar was transformed into a vast showcase for a wide range of sea, air, and space exhibits. Up on the flight deck, a whole squadron of planes like this sleek A-12 Blackbird spy plane, still the fastest in the world, and this Soviet MiG-21 supersonic fighter jet. The Intrepid has grown into the world's largest naval museum with a fleet of seven historic ships, including the destroyer Edson, the lightship Nantucket, and the submarine Growler, the only strategic missile sub open to the public. Each year, more than half a million people of all ages and from all parts of the world visit Intrepid. But the first hit that we ever got was a torpedo. Now here's how we travel in the South Pacific. Former Intrepid crewmen volunteer their time to take people around the museum and answer questions. What's that? How did the planes get up there though? Okay, oh, I didn't show you number two elevator, come on. Yeah, I was on that torpedo plane there. I flew aboard that plane. That's the same type George Bush flew in, the President of the United States. For these men, sharing their ship with others is something they enjoy doing. Grazie, Tante. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure having you aboard. Thank you. Okay, so very good. Very good. Well, this is a uh, wonderful museum and a, really a living museum because it gives everyone the opportunity to see the kind of service that occurred during the Second World War, all the wars that the United States fought. It's uh, particularly meaningful to me and my family because my father-in-law served on the Intrepid at the very end of World War II. So every time he comes to, uh, to New York City, he takes my children here and he shows them where his plane was at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, flight deck and tells them about all the hidden places on the Intrepid. It's a very, very special place for us personally, but it's a very special place for New York City too. Each year, Intrepid hosts New York's Fleet Week celebration, when ships from many countries take part in a great parade, sailing up the Hudson River to the museum.
And over time, the museum has become a popular meeting place for visiting dignitaries and celebrities from around the world. Margaret Thatcher is just one of the recipients of Intrepid's annual Salute to Freedom Award, presented to leaders who promote and defend freedom and democracy. Serving in two wars, Intrepid gained a reputation as a ship that never gave up, that came back no matter what. So it seemed almost fitting that in the end, she was saved from the scrap heap to become a living monument to our nation's veterans. It was a final comeback, for which many are very grateful. When I stand there at the dock and just look at her bow, and the, the way she, she has a clipper bow, and, and, and she's just beautiful to look at. And, and it, you know, even now I, I get goosebumps uh, thinking about it. When you walk on the Intrepid, she fought, and she fought very well. But she fought by having people fight. Aviators left those decks. Some didn't return, some did, having changed their lives forever during a single flight. She shot down airplanes from those decks, and she was hit, and people died in the ship. When I walk around Intrepid, I can feel that. It's there. It's alive. I can't tell you how proud I am of the fact that my good friend Zach Fisher saved Intrepid and put it in a place in New York City where it would serve as an example for uh, young people and for old people to uh, remember not only the ship Intrepid, but uh, those brave men of that time who were willing to go down to the sea in ships to engage in combat to protect freedom and to restore freedom where freedom had been lost all in the name of the American people.